I uh, just want us to pray that God will mightily use this tape in your life, in your home, in your church, and in our world as we are facing these days ahead of us. It looks rather shaky. Things look very, very, very bleak. And I'll tell you, if your eyes are not fixed upon Jesus, if you're really not settled in his faithfulness, in the word of God, I know that you're in real, real trouble. I uh, know that I'd like to just share uh, something of a, of a promise with you as I just start out in this uh, particular uh, message out of the Amplified Bible, the fourth chapter. Let me just read the uh, first two or three verses. Therefore, while the promises of entering in his rest still holds and is offered today, let us be afraid to distrust it, lest any of you should think he has come too late and has come short of reaching it. For indeed we have had the glad tithing of God proclaimed to us just as truly as they, the Israelites of old, did when the good news of deliverance from bondage came to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because it was not mixed with faith, that is, with the leaning of the entire personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom and goodness. And those who heard it, neither were they united in faith with Joshua and Caleb, the ones who heard did believe. For we who have believed, who have adhered to and trusted and relied on God, do enter into that rest in accordance with his declaration that those who did not believe should not enter when he said, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. And this he said, although his works had been completed and prepared and waiting for all who would believe from the foundation of the world. Uh, scripture reference for that last uh, scripture I gave you there as uh, Psalms 95:11. Now, here's what I want to say. The children of God, the children of God did not get into the full blessings of God because they did not mix the promises with faith. Now, that's a very significant thing to remember. And uh, and the faith of vic life of victory for those who believe and have faith in God are still available for us today. So let us labor to enter into that rest. And the works of God have been completed and prepared and waiting for all who would believe from the foundation of the world. And that's something as three things. One is they uh, did not mix the promises with faith. And that's something. And uh, the rest that was offered to the children of Israel is offered unto us today, and we need to believe. We just need to believe uh, that we and labor that we enter into that rest. And the things that we are to believe God for have been completely prepared waiting for all who would believe from the foundation of the world. Isn't that something? Now, I'm reminded of another verse of Scripture that I have been um, dealing with a great deal in these days, and uh, that is Ephesians 2.10. And I want to read that to you out of the Amplified Bible. For we are God's own handiwork, His workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready 
for us to live. Isn't that amazing? God prearranged this life for us that we may uh, just walk in that path. So this is so beautiful. And I trust that God is making himself real to you. Well, thank the Lord. It's good to just be with you. I just thought I'd share those few things that were just laying right here on top of the desk. And uh, I had no intentions of doing any more than just giving you those few thoughts to think about and pray about and, and be blessed about over uh, against what we're facing in our day because we are facing a lot of tragedy. Boy, I mean, things are up in the air, and, and we're going to be able to discuss some of those things that are up in the air in this tape. And uh, I know if you're uh, like I am, I am really uh, having a great deal of disturbance. And so uh, I need to know something of the mind of God about uh, myself, my family, my church, and my world. And my we are facing drastic changes right and left. And I feel like with facing these drastic changes, uh, we need to discuss them. Now, the Lord is blessing in a beautiful way. Uh, one of the things that He's doing right now that I want to share with you and I want you to pray with me about is that God is setting up some unique Bible conferences and we have the blessed privilege of having Roy Hessen over here in the month of October and the month of November. And uh, Roy Hessen is the man who wrote Calvary Road. And if you've never read Calvary Road, uh, you need to read Calvary Road. It's a very inexpensive little book, but it's definitely a book that God will use to minister mightily to your life. And so I trust that you will uh, get a hold of that book, and if you are not near a bookstore or something like that, you, uh, you write us, and we'll get it to you as, as near wholesale cost as possible. And I think we can do that. I think that uh, we will have extra copies on hand because we're having Hessen in our area. So um, it may be that you might be interested in the rest of his books. He's written a number of books recently. One of, the, one of his latest books is My Calvary Road. You may be interested in it. But I want you to pray. I, I really depend on this tape club group to be uh, a group of prayer warriors for me. And so you pray about these conferences. Boy, Hess and I will be in two conferences together, and uh, we'll be having a great time together. And I, I believe that the Lord is going to bless mightily. I want you to pray for uh, my wife, Martha, as she's taking on more and more speaking engagements. And the Lord is blessing her beautifully. And uh, her health is just doing wonderful. Uh, we're, we're just we're real, real excited about how God has really moved in and uh, blessed in her health situation. And, uh, you know, I'm real thrilled that he's still blessing mightily in my health situation. I just, uh, I, you know, just in the atmosphere of praising God because how good God has been to me. I don't know when I've ever felt any better, and uh, I don't know when I've ever worked any harder. And I really feel the urge uh, to say and go and do as much as possible because we're at the end of the rope in this country, and things have got to change. Something has got to take place. And if we do not see God do a great and mighty work, I feel in these next few years, I know that we're, we're done for. So I'm interested in getting the books and tapes out and my own life out and share with the, with the people of the world what I believe is my conviction as to what the need of the hour is. 
And I know that you might just ask that question. Uh, Brother Manley, what do you think the need of this hour is? Well, I know that we need help in so many areas. But the need of the hour is for a mighty revival. And I will explain what I mean by on this level. We, we are in need for men to see that the answer is not within themselves. It's within God. This afternoon, I went to a ball game. To me, it was as important as any great game that's ever been played. And the reason for it is that our son that's 14 uh, was on the team, and he's one of the key players, and he uh, enjoys it, and he is a good boy. And God is blessing him, and he has a wonderful testimony. And so um, they came up against the number one school in the area, and our team won. And uh, our team is made up of a, a, just a whole group of Christian fellows, good boys, just fantastic little fellows. And they've been so friendly and so uh, fine, you know, uh, through these last couple of years that they've been together. And um, I was walking back to my vehicle as these... Uh, kids uh, came off the field after winning and uh, and I noticed our Christian boys just scream into the top of our vo- their voices we are number one we are number one and you know I, I just the thought just went through me you know they're not even aware of the uh, fact that God has enabled them to do all this you know, and there, I, I couldn't hear God in any, any voice anywhere. And you know, you might say, well, God doesn't have a lot to do with a football game. Well, he possibly uh, doesn't, uh, you know, calculate this one will win, that one will win. He just knows what's going on. And he knows who's going to win and who should win and who should not win because of their temperament and their relationship to God. And I know that everything happens in a boy's life, whether it's football or whatever, has been designed of God to bring that boy to God, whether it's a win or a loss, and so on and so forth. So we could talk about that. But I I didn't hear God. I didn't see God. I I didn't hear those boys recognizing God. And it just really shook me as we walked off of that field because, you see, uh, we're number one. And God is shaking this nation right now about being number one. I mean just really shaking this nation about being number one. And I mean God is shaking this nation in such a way that, friend, we're no longer number one. And I mean God is breaking down the power structure of this nation. And God is breaking down the uh, strength of this nation. And God is just tearing it apart. And it's obvious right now that, that there's no telling how much of a recession that we may go even go in. And it could just fall apart overnight. And um, and the need is for men and women to recognize that God is number one. That it's first God and then us. And uh, I think the need of this nation tonight is for a mighty revival that re- will restore God to number one. That men in high places will recognize that it's God that's made the way, that's made everything possible, that's made everything available, that's enabled us to carry on, that it's God. It's our eternal, ever-living God. It's our Father. It's our Savior. It's our Lord that's made all this possible. 
And so I just, I'm praying for that kind of revival. Praise God. I, I didn't intend to get in and start preaching at this point. But I, I just really feel that, that this is the great need of this hour. And I'm trusting that God will awaken our people. I had a man called today that feels like that his ministry can touch 20 million people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, I believe his, I believe it will touch 20 million people. And he says that that already the stage is set for people to listen, listen to the gospel, listen to the gospel. But they're not going to listen to the gospel out of the traditional setting, the traditional setting, the old church setting. Wow, that really shook me. That really shook me because still, most of my ministry is in what you'd consider the old church setting. And here he is saying the world is not going to receive the gospel out of an old church setting. And more, I tell you, that, that really helped me to see that uh, some way, somehow, God is going to have to raise up ideas that are initiated by him that are so different but it's going to get the gospel out. God did strange things back in the New Testament day. He used the New Testament church and I don't think he's going to change from the New Testament church. I think the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And I believe the church is going to be right on line, right on through. And I think it will be through the church that God will mightily move. But I do believe that the church will come up with God-initiated approaches to reaching the masses with the gospel of Jesus Christ for salvation and deepening of their spiritual life. That will be it will be shocking to us as they do this. But may God help us to see the need for this this very hour. This very day. May we need God to move in on the scene. And I believe that the need of this hour is for a mighty revival. My heart is earnestly yearning for a mighty revival. And I can see God moving in and across the country on the basis of a mighty revival. Now, I had not intended to get into what I've just been into. I've been just talking to you. And I have not, I really had not intended for uh, this to... uh, really come into action. But one of the things I did intend to do with you this month is just ask questions. Just ask questions and answer them. And uh, the questions that I am asking are questions that have been written to me. And I just want to discuss for a little bit. And uh, so uh, would you... uh, Listen with me as we uh, discuss these different questions. The first question that I want to discuss with you is this question. Why do I have doubts about my salvation? And is it possible for me to fall from grace? Well, this particular question uh, has two questions to it, doesn't it? And so we're going to just uh, possibly deal with both, but not thoroughly. Now, you will remember this about this particular message. 
I haven't studied these questions and gone in and, and prepared a sermon for these questions. And thereby, I'm just going to answer these questions right off of the cuff, right out of my heart. And uh, much of the scripture that I'll give uh, will be scripture that I'll be recalling from memory. And many times I cannot give you the book, chapter, and verse of these scriptures, but I will give you a partial quotation of them. And I trust that if you really are looking for them, that you will be able to work that out with your own Bible study. Why do I have doubts about my salvation? Well, we're assuming that you are saved. Some people have doubts about their salvation because they are not saved by the grace of God. Of course, that's a, that's not answering the question that we're assuming here that the person has salvation, I guess. But let me just say this in introducing this thought. Many, many people that I've talked to about Jesus and they've had doubts about whether or not they were saved and it was because they were not saved. They were not saved. They had actually come to God on some humanistic approach. They would made a decision for God. This is a thing that's uh, uh, really popular among us Baptists. We make decisions for God and uh, there's no evidence that God committed himself to that person when they made that decision. So they doubt their salvation because the decision was on a very emotional level or an intellectual level rather than a spiritual level. Rather than a spiritual level. And so uh, people doubt their salvation because they've never had salvation. But now if a person is genuinely born of the Spirit, and you must be born of the Spirit, the Bible says you're genuinely born of the Spirit, you can doubt your salvation, and you would doubt your salvation if there's known sin in your heart, known sin in your life, or, let me say, known disobedience in your life, you would doubt salvation. We used to put it this way, that if you were living in sin, you would doubt your salvation. And if God had given you something like called you into some particular type of ministry and you had not obeyed, that's being disobedient to light, that you would doubt your salvation. So I believe a person doubts whether or not they are saved when there is some kind of sin in their life, rebellion in their life of some sort. Then the devil has a way. Now what do you think about Satan suggesting thoughts to us that we're not saved? Now, I believe Satan can suggest thoughts to a person that they're not saved. But uh, suggesting thoughts into your mind that you're not saved is a great deal different than making you doubt your salvation. In my way of understanding, the difference between suggesting the thoughts in your mind and doubting your salvation. Now, is it possible for me to fall from grace? Uh, I believe that there's no scriptural basis, really, that thoroughly makes it firm that a person could ever fall from grace. There are some scriptures in the Bible that indicate that people get away from grace, but I believe that once a person is in grace, they, they are always in grace, and that they cannot fall from grace. Now, the reason I'm moving on here is not because I'm through. I am uh, not through. I just, I know I, my time is limited if I'm going through these nine questions that have been asked me. And uh, so I am going through most of these questions. Now, here's another question that is really good. What is the spirit feel life? What is the spirit feel life? I believe the spirit feel life is the is a saved person that's saved by the grace of God, keeping their sins confessed up to date, and being obedient to the light that God has given them. Now I believe this uh, spirit-filled life starts when a person is saved, and if they were actually obedient to all the light, 
and also uh, keeping their sins confessed up to date, that they could by faith stay filled with the Holy Spirit right on from the time they're born again. Most people I have talked to, which have been thousands, did not do it that way. They got saved and lived a wishy-washy life, a very immature life, and then later on up the road, they got filled with the Holy Spirit so that when they got filled, they realized that the filling of the Holy Spirit was for them. Be not drunk with wine where in excess, but be ye filled with the Holy Spirit. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit by confessing their sins, getting their lives cleaned up, and then a simple work of grace through faith. They believed, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And as they were filled with the Holy Spirit, then they maintained that filling of the Holy Spirit by the fact that they grieved not, they quenched not, and they walked by the Holy Spirit. All of this is so beautifully put in the Bible. Now, um, let me just say this. When we talk about the filling of the Holy Spirit, we're talking about a continuous work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. And we're talking about every believer should be filled with the Holy Spirit. The next question is, what is the difference in the baptism of the Holy Spirit that D.L. Moody and Charles G. Finney makes reference to, opposed to the charismatic um, baptism they refer to with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Now, I would really enjoy speaking to this a great deal, and I will just tell you what's on my heart. I, I believe that... Uh, well, let me just give my testimony a little bit, and you'll pick up the truth as we go along. Back when I first became a Christian and got hungry for a work of God in my life, it was a hung I was hungry for the work of the Holy Spirit. I was hungry for the work of the Holy Spirit in my heart to endue me with power to be a mighty, mighty witness for winning people to the lost. And this was a longing of my heart. And I studied dozens of books that related to this matter of the baptism of fire or power or the endowment of power and the endowment of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and out of all of these books, nothing about tongues was mentioned. But uh, the, what was pictured was the fact that, that if a person got properly related to the Lord in a given situation that he would be mightily endued with power for service. For service. And then um, he would have to continue to seek the face of God for mighty endowments of power for other occasions of service. And um, so I just looked into the book of Acts, and Acts 2, and when the Holy Spirit came, you know, he baptized people uh, into the body of Christ. And this is certainly what happened. He baptized them. But there's just only one baptism like this. And that is he baptized us all into the body of Christ. And, and um, when we get saved by the grace of God, we're baptized into that body of Christ. It's one baptism. But another thing happened there in Acts 2 was that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've already talked about how a person could be filled and so on. And um, so I feel that uh, the filling of the Holy Spirit is definitely a, a work, but I believe that they were also endued with power for service here in this chapter. And uh, I, I think you can see that very easily. They were endued with power, and they were not only endued in Acts 2. In Acts 4, they were endued with power again. And um, I do have a little more material on this, in uh, some of the tapes that were preached about two years or two and a half years ago. And if you're interested in some of those tapes, uh, you know, you can get them out of our office. But uh, nevertheless, you know, this, uh, this endowment, our mighty baptism, is definitely, to me, a work of the Holy Spirit apart from the baptism into the body of Christ 
and the filling of the Holy Spirit in day by day walk. And I prefer to call it an endowment rather than a baptism. Now, I think the, it's unfortunate that the Pentecostal people, or should I say charismatic people, not Pentecostal people, have chosen to say that this is a baptism. And, uh, the, you know, if they want to call it a baptism, I won't fuss about that. But the fact that they add to it, or they fuse it with the filling, and they all not only fuse this baptism with the filling, or this endowment with the filling, they fuse it with the evidence of tongues. And I think what they've done is they have so categorized God at this point that uh, he cannot cease, he cannot continue to be God in a given situation. In other words, they say you must have this experience. Now, I, uh, I've looked at the life of Finney and I've looked at the life of Moody, and I'm not interested in throwing stones at them, but I do, you know, feel that they use the word baptism uh, rather loosely because one time they would refer to the baptism as a uh, the word uh, endowment as baptism, and another time they would uh, uh, refer to the uh, endowment as a filling. And uh, I can't be too critical of them because look how they left us a mighty, mighty heritage. My God mightily used them and poured His Spirit out upon them and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people were saved by the grace of God and I'm certainly not interested in criticizing them. And uh, I wouldn't criticize them over their misuse of a word. Um, in my own ministry, I've gone through different stages and I have referred to the filling as a baptism of or endowment of power. I've even referred to it as a baptism at two or three different times. And then I have uh, referred to the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, that's a legitimate baptism into the body of Christ as a filling and I haven't distinguished it as I should. And so I find that we all make mistakes with the with matter of words. But uh, let's be sure that we reach right into the heart of man and we really understand what he's saying. I heard Bob Gray say this one time years ago when I saw him mighty moved. He said, I, I don't know what uh, to call this, a baptism or a filling or an anointing. He just said, I know there's a mighty work of the Holy Spirit on the life of a believer that enables him to accomplish God's end. Now, I believe that is to be called an endowment rather than a baptism. Now, I, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, we are at, uh, we're using words to identify ourselves and to cause division among us that's really creating a great havoc in our day because, boy, the day now has come to the point where we're in such drastic days that, boy, we need to see the work of God and we need to drop our uh, sword, so to speak. And I'm not talking about compromising with the word of, uh, compromising the Word of God. But we need to meet around the throne room of glory on the basis of the cross, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And my dear friends, proclaim the truth that will help people and bring people to the living Lord. Uh, now another question. And I'm sure that I did not cover that question as much as I should have. But another question. And how do I get my prayers answered? How and when about a prayer? Well, I think you ought to pray uh, when you want to pray. I think you ought to pray when you don't want to pray. And I think you ought to pray uh, with a heart that's in un uni union with the Lord. That means oneness with the Lord to where your desires are his desires so you can have your desires. And I believe you ought to believe when you pray that you ought to believe that God is answering them right now. I believe that. I believe you ought to expect it. I believe that to be expected right this very moment. Now, uh, let me just ask you another question. And it's obvious that I'm not going to get through all these uh all of these questions. What about the economic problem 
that we see today and how does this relate to the things of the Bible? Well, boy, I, you know, I may could spend the rest of my time right here. And so you just hang on. Let me just go as hurriedly as I can. It's very obvious that the Lord teaches us that Jesus is going to come again. And uh, most of the people I've studied after, including myself, have believed that uh, before the Lord comes again, that uh, that He's going to put America to the test. Now, I'm not saying that He's going to put us in the tribulation, but He's going to put us to the test. And I believe He's doing that right now. I believe He's putting to the test. I believe we have sinned against God. Materialism has been the major sin. And the independence of God. And I believe God's going to touch us at this point. And I believe that's where we're headed right now. Now, I believe that uh, you can call it a depression or a time of inflation or recession or whatever you want to call it. But God is going to speak to this nation before Jesus comes. And I believe that it's going to help us. I believe it's really going to help us. And uh, I would urge you as a child of God to prepare your heart as much as possible to live in these latter days. I mean, prepare your heart to be able to look unto God and find Him and believe Him and see Him manifest Himself in leading your life daily. Now, I wish I could spend a lot of time answering these questions. Now, I've got so interested in answering them, I, I'd like to go back and answer all of them over again and get in more detail. But we're going now to have our next month, uh, our, our next program. The rest of this program, I'll get it straight in a moment, is going to be the first radio program that we're going to put on. It's going on there just in a few weeks. So we wanted to share it with you. And my purpose, let me say this in closing, my purpose in going on radio is to prepare the people, help the people to know how to live in these last days. That's what it's for. And so I'm going to be talking about faith, the one message that I love to share. So you pray with us, and may God richly bless you. Hello, I'm Mac Kearney, Media Director for FIRE, which is Faith International Revival Enterprises, a division of Gospel Harvesters. And before we play this uh, audition tape for you of the Living Faith, which is our 15-minute daily Monday through Friday program, I thought I'd just uh, enlighten you on a few things about the broadcast that you might want to know. Uh, as it begins, you'll hear our opening theme, which was written and uh, produced uh, by Ron and Patricia Owens. And many of you are familiar with them and their work. And uh, Ron uh, wrote this. And the theme itself has a, a great message in itself. And I want you to just listen to that. And I want to thank uh, Lynn Farr, the announcer on this radio uh uh, broadcast who is who will follow with the announcing part and uh, this sample intro that's on this tape uh, can be uh, changed uh, to fit uh, to fit the many needs that uh, are there uh, depending on who the sponsor is I just like to say that uh, we're really excited about the way people are responding uh, to the broadcast uh, we've had many people write in and respond and call and uh, we're excited that Christian businessmen and laymen are responding all over the United States. Uh, what has really surprised uh, Brother Manley is that a lot of the pastors of various churches are responding. And we're finding, and uh, they're telling us, that they want, first of all, a broadcast that will honor the Lord. And second of all, uh, these men want uh, a broadcast whose ministry and teachings identifies with theirs, and, and a lot of these people are real close friends of, of Brother Manley. And third of all, they want a program that will minister to the total Christian community. And as a result of sponsoring it, will uh, draw other people and families to their church. 
And finally, uh, this broadcast can provide a time during the opening and close uh, to share uh, their ministries within their own church with the community and what's going on there. Now, I want to say that we're in 13 different markets right now. And uh, as of this recording, we're uh, just starting the Little Rock Market, Olivet Baptist Church. They are sponsored it. Uh, their pastor is Lamar Lifer. And uh, we anticipate being on Dallas Station here uh, within about two weeks. And should you be interested in getting details on how to get the broadcast in your area or how to sponsor it, call us at uh, Gospel Harvesters. That's area code 817-267-5992. Or write us at Gospel Harvesters, Post Office Box 872, Ulysses, Texas, 76039. I ask that you pray for Brother Manley uh, in this endeavor and, and pray for us. Uh, I just, just really like to be specific that you pray for his physical strength to make the tapes and for the time that's needed to do them. Uh, this has presented a problem, and uh, we just pray that the Lord would give us a victory over it. And then I'd like to thank the people who have already supported the radio ministry in the initial start-up period by their prayers and uh, by those who have responded with uh, financial gifts. And we just praise the Lord uh, for you, and you know who you are, in, uh, in standing with us. We, we've had a lot of expense, and, and we just praise the Lord for meeting it. He's so faithful. Now, I just wanted to say this as an introduction to the broadcast, and we hope you enjoy it. And as you listen uh, and have time, uh, let us hear from you and, and let us hear your comments. We want this to really honor the Lord. And I want you to know one other thing, that there'll never be a mention of money on any of these broadcasts. And we just, we just feel like that we're going to have a, a broadcast that's really going to uh, spark an interest uh, within the community, within our own denomination and within our churches. Now listen, listen prayerfully as Brother Manley comes to you with the living faith. Faith is the substance of what you are looking for before it has even arrived. God says it, that settles it, now go act upon it and you'll have a faith that's alive. To get in on what God has promised his children depends on some action from you. A faith that is living means more than just trusting, it's acting on that which is true. Living faith, trusting in the Lord. Welcome to today's broadcast of The Living Faith, brought to you by Friends of Manly Beasley. We're encouraged by your listening to us, and it's our prayer that God will use these messages to do a great work in each of your lives. Brother Manley's ministry has been greatly used over the last 30 years in pastoring and evangelism, and we hope that these broadcasts will spark a desire for a closer walk with the Lord in every listener's heart. And now, Manley Beasley. Greetings, friend. It's a joy and a privilege to be with you today. I'm looking forward to this opportunity of sharing with you what the Lord has shared with me these 30 years in the ministry. These months ahead, we're going to be covering a subject that I believe to be very vital in our day. When there is so much economic unrest, when there is so much um, disturbance in the physical world, and there's so many people getting sick on every hand, I believe that uh, the subject that we're going to cover is going to be very vital. The subject that we're going to cover is that of how to put your trust in the Lord. Another way of saying it is that we're going to be trusting uh, that God will communicate the message of faith to the hearts of the believers in these days when man is so confused and he's looking for reality. I believe that the reality that's to be had in the Lord Jesus, I believe that reality is found 
when man comes into a proper relationship with Jesus Christ by faith. I believe in this day and time when people are uh, wanting to work on every hand and they're very active about the things of God and God is very popular, I believe the key to knowing God and the reality of God in the realm of the physical, in the realm of the economic, I believe is in properly trusting Jesus Christ. And so today we're going to talk about that uh, matter of how to trust the Lord. But for the next few months, for about three months, we're going to be trusting that God will reveal this message to us. Now, if you have your Bibles and you want to study with me out of your Bibles each day, you may turn with me. It may be that you're in a place where you cannot turn with me, so uh, you can listen as I read the Word of God. The disciples came to Jesus, and uh, they asked the Lord Jesus a question. And that question was, Lord, what, the, what is it that we might do that we might work the works of God? Now, this is a very uh, pertinent question, very vital question. Lord, what is it that we might do that we might work the works of God? Well, you know, back years ago, I asked myself that question. Lord, what is it that I might do that I might work the works of God? And I thought about what, uh, you know, I would have said years ago. Uh, Lord, what is it that I might do that I might work the works of God? I thought that working the works of God was uh, putting your trust in Jesus as your Savior, getting saved by the grace of God, washed in the blood of the Lamb, and trying your best. But... Uh, that trying your best business wound up in me uh, trying to read my Bible every day, uh, trying to give my money to the church, uh, trying to go out and witness every day, trying to uh, be the best man I could. And I found that uh, as I tried to do these works, the more I tried, the more I fell. And I found that... Uh, that I was a complete failure in trying to work the works of God. But if you had asked me back in those days, uh, Brother Manley, what is it that I might do that I might work the works of God, I would have told you, well, do this thing, do this thing, do this thing, do this thing, do this thing. If you're, if you're reading your Bible every day and if you're praying every day and if you're giving your money to the church every day and uh, you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus every day and trying to live the best you can... That's the works of God. Well, you know, that uh, was not the answer Jesus gave his disciples. Now, he told them in John 6, 28 and 29, and you may have wondered why I um, uh, hesitated to give you that scriptural reference there, and I didn't want you to jump ahead of me. Uh, this, this thing, John 6, 28 and 29. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, Now watch it. This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he has sent. In other words, Jesus said the work of God is that you believe on the Lord Jesus whom the Father has sent. Now, isn't that interesting? That you believe on the Lord Jesus whom the Father has sent. Now, you may uh, be like I was when I first saw that. I said, well, Lord, I believe on the Lord Jesus whom thou has sent. I believed on him back when I discovered that I was a lost sinner. And I put my trust in Jesus. And there was a mighty work done in my life. I became a Christian. I was born of the Spirit of God. I was birthed into the kingdom of God. I was born according to the promises of God. I became a new creation in Christ Jesus. 
my life has never been the same since that day. Why, Lord, I have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But um, it seems here that the continuous work of the believer is to believe on the Lord Jesus as a, a man believes when he gets saved by the grace of God. And if we constantly keep our faith up to date, believing on the Lord Jesus in the now, then this is the work of God. This is the work of God. And, of course, the work of God will be manifested. Now, Abraham believed on the Lord Jesus, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And this brings us to a definition of faith, and we will cover many definitions. Sometimes we may cover a definition or two a day. Or maybe one day we'll not cover any definition. But um, as Abraham believed on the Lord Jesus and it was counted unto him for righteousness, we, we find that Abraham was not only saved by faith in the Lord, but he was saved by works. Now we know this, that one is talking about that he was counted as righteous before God by cause of his faith in God. And then he was counted as righteous before God and holy before man because of his faith in God. In other words, there was works. He was working the works of God. This illustration offers unto us, I believe, a truth that you and I need to see. In Hebrews 11:13. We have what I consider a classic definition of faith. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that there were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now, you may have a different translation than I have. I'm using uh, the regular King James translation, and I love this translation. And I love this verse out of this translation. And I want to give it to you again. It's Hebrews 11:13. Now watch it. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now we have this beautiful definition of faith here. First we see that faith sees the promises. Now, the promises reveal the mind of God, the truth of God. The promises stand for the revelation of God to man here at this point. All right, these people saw the promises of God. Now, faith sees the promises of God. Faith sees things as God sees them. Faith has God's outlook. Faith is able to see just as God sees a thing. All right? Then not only does faith see, but faith is persuaded. In other words, uh, faith is convinced. There is a environment where a man becomes convinced that this is the way of God. Walk ye in it. All right? After man becomes convinced, after man is persuaded of the promises, then he embraces the promises. This means there is a decision within his heart that I'm going to take God at his word. I'm going to take God at his word now. Not tomorrow, but now. He's no longer living in the past. He's no longer living in the future. He's living in the now. I am believing God that he is doing this thing now that he is taking care of this thing right now. Now, once man has believed this in his heart, the next step is that he confesses. He confesses with his mouth. Romans 10 tells us, if, what, if we believe with our heart, we confess with our mouth. And so here we have the definition of faith that brings us into uh, the faith that God wants us to have 
in relationship to Jesus. And this is the work of God, that you believe on him whom the Father has sent. No wonder he said, no wonder he said in... uh, uh, Matthew 6, Matthew 6, um, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You see, the Lord wants us to trust him now. This is the work of God that you trust him now, that you be looking in and seeing what God sees, being persuaded of it, believing it now, believing that God is doing this thing in you and through you and for you now. And what you believe with your heart, you confess with your mouth. And what you confess with your mouth, you'll see that God is able to bring it to pass. Now we're going to follow this line of thinking right through this matter of trusting God for the next three months. How to trust God. How to convert truth into reality. I trust that you'll join us. It's been a real blessing today to be with you. We'll see you tomorrow.